Hamakua is the northeast section of the big island of Hawaii. Along Hamakua's 50-mile stretch of land between Hilo and Waipio, the beauty of nature is everywhere. Timeless are her rainforests and waterfalls that cling to emerald cliffs. The rugged coastal terrain abruptly meets the sea. Breathtaking Waipio Valley is the northernmost border of the Hamakua district. For six miles, lush Waipio stretches from the mountain to the sea. Bounded by massive cliffs, it is a secluded haven of terra farms and wildlife. In the valley, the source of life, fresh water, overflows, replenished by abundant rainfall. Once the home of Hawaiian kings, now Waipio Valley is the home of Kia Fronda and others who, like him, tenaciously strive to preserve the Hawaiian lifestyle and culture. Waipio was first settled around 1100 AD. Shortly after, the population exceeded 1,000, then 5,000, and some historians even say 10,000 people once lived in Waipio Valley. Waipio is also known as the Valley of the Kings. Some of the royalty and ruling chiefs in Waipio are Kiha, Liloa, Hakau, Umi, and of course one of the most famous one was Kamehameha. My grandfather, who lived here the latter 1930s up to 1957, traveled this footpath either by walking or riding his horse and mules. The mules were the main vehicles to transport charo up the valley. The valley floor is fairly flat and the valley floor is very verdant, rich in natural nutrients. And this is why the Hawaiians wanted Waipio Valley to raise taro. Water was in abundance. Waipio was supplied by five major springs. And the major springs and the tributaries converge into one river called the Wailoa River. And the Wailoa River, as it curves through the valley, is where Waipio gets its name. For Waipio means curving water. In 1946, April 1, disaster struck Waipio, and with that came the tidal wave, or tsunami. The tsunami was estimated to be 50 feet high, and it came into Waipio by hitting the Z-Trail wall first, ricocheted off the Z-Trail wall, it came around towards the red house that is situated in the middle of the valley next to the river. From there it came back out. That was the third wave and the third wave was one of the highest waves. Surprisingly no one was killed. A lot of people were thrown around but by the third wave they had enough time to settle their horses, mules, donkeys or whatever and make it for high ground. Waipio is, uh, you can't describe it. I, I can tell you about it but most people have to experience it. It's a it's a spiritual place, but if you come to terms with people that want to know exactly how it's like, the only thing I can think of is stressless. It is a peace within the heart especially, and the mind, that uh, make us remain here. The reason why I am here is because I think of my background, where I'm from, and taro is a definite Hawaiian culture. And that's what I'd like to continue to tell the children of Hawaii, no matter what kind, how, how the Hawaiians were brought up about taro farming, what kind of taro, and uh, the importance of the water. It's, it's like the vein that goes through the body. If the, the blood stops, then, then you have heart attack. It's the same way with taro. If they stop the water, it goes into the taro patch, then your taro won't be as good. A lot of them die. And this is what I try to convey. And that is my main reason why I keep the taro patch open.
for the children of tomorrow. Oh, well, I live in here. I you know, mostly clean the pets and uh, watch the water and, you know, not too much job, you know, this, you know, the pets. If it's open already, somebody else opened this already, see. I just come down here and take care. Eh? So kind of easy already. <laughs> the first guys who did this before, yeah. Uh, I'd rather stay on top. And I'll come down here just like loaf. <laughs> this is where I was born in 1932. This home here, but a little smaller house. After I was eight years old, the house was built. This house here was built. Then I was moved with my grandparents on the farther side of YPO Valley at the bottom of Nenevi Fall, which we call Nenevi. This particular area has the name. It's one village in YPO Valley, which we call Napopo. And the waterfall on our right, it's named after Hii, a boy from this valley, this part of the valley. The waterfall on our left is named after Lave, this girl that came from Kau, her name was Lavi. So this boat waterfall is named today Nani He Lavi. My grandfather's name was Sam Alia. He grew up here in this valley and he was a composer that reads a lot of, composed a lot of Hawaiian music about the valley and then he composed this song Nani He Lavi. In the 1800s, sugar was king. Waves of immigrant laborers entered the Hamakua district to work the fields. Ethnic groups such as the Chinese, Portuguese, Japanese and Filipinos. With surges of unpredictable market demands and fluctuating world prices, however, the sugar industry began to decline. Sugar mills closed, leaving laborers unemployed and nearby plantation towns abandoned. Well, there's been tremendous changes uh, in, this, uh, in this business since I've been associated with it. Uh, most of the cane was still cut by hand when I first came here. And, uh, and a lot of the field operations were still by large hand gangs. This has been uh, completely changed and uh, we're a highly mechanized uh, operation. Uh, I think that uh, there's been tremendous technolo technological changes during this period. And I think uh, probably right now we're, we're doing more, more in this area of uh, improving operations, technological improvements than at any time in my whole career. I find it a, a most exciting time. Today, the Hamakua Sugar Company survives. Owner Francis Morgan purchased the 35-mile plantation and the flailing sugar operation has been resurrected. Well, it was a, it was a major gamble buying this thing. Uh, a lot of people have wondered why I did it. I was reaching uh, uh, retirement age. Uh, I had uh, developed a, uh, uh, enough assets to live easily and comfortably for the rest of my life. And, uh, however, uh, it appeared to me that if it stayed in the hands of, uh, of uh, the former owners, that uh, there was a sizable chance that uh, within the, the near-term future it would be shut down because it really didn't fit their overall strategy. So I liquidated uh, all the assets I developed. Uh, I bought the place and in doing so incurred a major debt, which I am the sole guarantor. And so I've, uh, I've really put everything I have into this thing and also uh, uh, committed my future to it. Uh, a lot of people thought this was uh, foolhardy, <laughs> but uh, I felt that uh, this is a way I could make a major contribution, not only to this company and the people that live here and work here and depend upon it, but the economy the, of the state. And if I felt uh, I could make this kind of a contribution during my lifetime, it, it would have been uh, well worth it. Hamakura Sugar Company, like the rest of uh, the domestic U.S. sugar producers, has been set by a very difficult situation in the past decade. 
We have been forced to compete with heavily subsidized foreign producers. We have lacked an adequate price support mechanism, and it's become necessary to reduce our costs. We developed uh, five years ago a very comprehensive program designed to get our costs down to a level where we could compete even with the lowest cost subsidized foreign producers. Part of our program was diversifying our activities to generate revenue from other sources which were synergistic with and compatible to the basic operation. The most significant of these that has uh, come on stream is our beef cattle operation. There were some advantages we had which couldn't be duplicated by other processors of cattle in the state. The uh, Hawaii cattle industry has been in very difficult condition due to inadequate returns. And we felt getting into the business would uh, accomplish three things. We could increase the return paid to local ranchers for their cattle, thus assuring their viability. That we could produce a quality product which would compete effectively with mainland beef, and that we could provide an adequate return to Hamakua Sugar Company. As such, we invested four and a half million dollars in a cattle feedlot and a cattle slaughter processing plant. We've got about 6,500 head of cattle in the feed yard now. We bring them in weighing six and a half to 700 pounds, and we'll take them up to around 1,100 pounds fat and which is 120 to 150 days depending on what their end weight is. And from there they'll go to slaughter down to packing house. Some of the other things we're looking to in, in terms of future diversification is producing higher value products from molasses. We have commissioned uh, uh, Battelle Pacific Northwest Laboratories to examine possibilities for us. They've identified several products which could be produced from molasses using uh, fermentation and dehydration technology. One in particular is very attractive. It's a high-value industrial compound which we are in the process of patenting. And once we get a patent, I think that we can market this product through some of the large chemical companies and that could produce a lot of needed income for the company. Well, the Hamakua Coast is, uh, I've been extremely familiar with it for, uh, for uh, all 45 years, and, uh, and uh, d during this whole time, the general complexion has not changed much. It's basically been sugarcane. The method of doing the work has changed and all that. And I, I visualize uh, for the future, it'll continue to be basically a sugarcane operation. We will continue to uh, uh, develop technology. I think uh, in this process, the, uh, the jobs, the, the quality of the jobs we'll have will continue to increase because some of these new projects we're doing require a higher and higher technical knowledge. And, and it's a very diversified business and therefore there's a, a wide range of jobs and, and, uh, and uh, needing uh, not only technology but uh, business judgment and acumen. And so as, as I see, Basically, it'll continue the same uh, outward appearance and all that, uh, but with a gradually increasing technology and job satisfa satisfaction. Many of the laborers retired to enjoy the good life in Hamakua. During his free time, retired sugar plantation worker Lodi Reno is a master weaver and instructor in the art of coconut leaf weaving. Since I come over here in the year 1946, uh, Hawaii was still territory. And then I worked up Hakalau sugar plantations for around 29 years. I like the Hamakua coast very much because it's different. You can make also your garden or anything. You can make a chicken coop behind your house. Now at this time, <clears throat> I'm going to make a uh, to show you how to make a coconut hatch with these leaves that I have over here. Okay, that's it. Oh, yeah, I should. 
Isn't that nice? Many talented artisans and musicians also live in the Hamakua district. Fueled by the beauty of Hamakua's landscape, creative expression thrives. With a backdrop of a rainforest and a glimpse of the sea, local musicians of the group Jazz Arts stir the air with their music. Gordon Mota, ceramist, craftsman, and architect, and Laura Lewis, a textile fabric art designer, create works of art in quiet Ahuoloa, where they live. Before I started painting, I used to do uh, sewing with um, all kinds of fabrics. I used to do kind of a fabric collage, and I became interested in the techniques used to decorate the, the fabrics, uh, especially Japanese fabrics. Uh, they're so beautiful in the way that they were decorated and at that time there was very little information available about uh, the techniques that were used so I started to to uh, seek information about the different styles of painting that the Japanese used and the different techniques used in dyeing. Uh, working on silk is <clears throat> very much of a pleasure because it takes the the dyes so well and the colors uh, are very very true and shimmering it's uh, very light to work with uh, it only takes a, a light touch and sometimes it's like uh, painting with a feather almost Well, this is uh, my sketchbook, and uh, a lot of times when I'm doing the design, it's uh, very improvised. Even though I have uh, drawings to work from, it becomes very different when you're dealing with a large scale of two or three yards of fabric. I keep in mind certain elements that I like to use, certain design elements, and uh, I improvise from there as to what other lines I'll be using in the design. My work is quite recognizable by the what might be called a flamboyant glaze style. It's a combination of uh, scenic painting and Japanese brush painting and um, it, it's you don't find a, a true image there as you would uh, a painting on canvas. Um, the glazes, of course, are not uh, the accurate color that, that you see before they're fired. So, like I say, it's more of an impression or a dream or a reflection or an imagination or a thought that comes through in the imagery. Hamakura, you know, is a real quiet, remote, out of the way, and peaceful place. And um, that allows an artist to develop um, his own style without the um, trappings of the competition. Um, the environment here is so inspiring. Uh, you wake up every day and depending on the weather, you do what you have to do. If it's time to surf, that's what you do that day. If it's rainy and cloudy and you can't do anything else, you go to work in the studio. Well, years ago, you know, when I was just 11, I 
took art lessons from a lady in Hilo named Kei Yamamoto. And her influence has, is one of the more lasting influences in my artistic endeavors. When I went to California, I studied architecture at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and uh, that's an experience that I really cherish. I'll never forget. And of course, I'll carry with me all my life. A few miles upland are neighbors Eric and Hilary Gunther, who are successful orchid growers and wood creators. We uh, call ourselves Cloud Forest Orchids, and the reason we call, that, call ourselves that is because we're up here at about 2,500 feet elevation, and uh, we get lots of afternoons with a cloud coming in. Clouds come in, and it is, um, there's a type of orchid terrain in South and Central America that's called Cloud Forest Conditions which is what we have, and that enables us to grow a complete variety of, of these orchids. These are all hybrids. These have been hybridized from the original species. Starting in, in about 1850, people uh, from England went to Central and South America and brought back the orchids, and then they started making uh, hybrids between the different plants, and these are maybe 20 or 30 generations later. There are uh, approximately 25,000 naturally occurring orchid species in the world. They, I believe, are one of the largest plant families in the world. And from those 25,000 species, the hybridizers have created probably a quarter of a million man-made hybrids which have actually been registered through the Royal Horticultural Society in London. That's the fun of orchid growing, is to, to raise them up and see what you're going to get. With different types of wood gathered from nearby forests, the Gunthers perfect the art of wooden bracelet making, a process passed on to them by Hillary's father. What makes these bracelets special is that we are making them in a laminated process, which is that it's similar to plywood in that it has three layers that we glue together with epoxy, and that makes it possible to make these bracelets very thin and very strong. That's different from the usual wooden bracelet that you see because usually a wooden bracelet is carved on a lathe out of a solid piece of wood and therefore it has inherent weaknesses. But when you laminate the wood you can cut it down to an extremely thin bracelet which makes it real pretty and fine. My father who lived in Waimea discovered and uh, worked through this process himself over a period of years and was very proud of the fact that he had invented this process. And we were very fortunate that he passed this on to us and now we're carrying on for him. The Honoka town was actually began to get active when the plantations come in. And it was when the, the, the Haino mill was put in that the town was, uh, was uh, I guess, structured around that. And at that time, of course, like all the plantations, all the immigrants were brought in, the Portuguese, the Japanese, the Filipinos. And there was predominantly uh, Portuguese. There was a large population of Portuguese. So within the area, we had lots of the Portuguese culture. In this community, uh, the kachikachi, as you call it, it's really the samba. The, it's very popular. If you go to a public uh, function, say um, a wedding or something like that, there's any type of dancing, you're going to come around to some samba music, and everybody gets into the act and really have a good time. Restoration actually is a subject that's dear to my heart because I was quite involved with it. Uh, here at the Honoka Credit Union, we had a splendid opportunity to take a hundred year old department store and to strip it down to basics and to um, do what you see right now. We, we did a historical preservation on the outside and inside 
its adaptive reuse. So we picked up uh, some of the items from the period. We have the oak floors, if you'll notice that. And the tallow windows have the grates on it. It's just to kind of give it a period. After that, everything is functional. Everything is done to make it very functional for us. But on the outside, we're very, very um, concerned about retaining the, the integrity of the building. Uh, it's a great town to live in. Uh, it's very active. There's an awful lot of activities to go on, like, you know, with me, with my family. There's never a dull moment. We were always involved with one thing or the other. Uh, there's lots of activities in the community. There's a real cohesiveness amongst the people here. And just recently, we had a group that uh, began to have classes and training. These girls had gone to Portugal and came back with costumes and things and revived the Shabbat to dance here. In the district of Hamakua, change is slow. Places like Honaka and Waipio Valley look and feel much as they have for generations as the people of Hamakua continue to blend the rich traditions of their past with the future.